So, since we've put up all of these courses on this channel, we just wanted to um, give people who are new to the channel, new to all this material, a bit of background on kind of the perspective that all of these courses are coming from and a bit of background on the, pr the professor who's teaching them, Dr. Clausen. Um, to start at the beginning, um, as is good to do, um, what, are, what was something or someone maybe who initially inspired you to get into scholarship? Was there a particular professor that was really inspirational, a book that gave you that initial excitement to get into what you've been doing ever since? Um, well, it's nice to be here. Thanks for doing this, May. Uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this process. Uh, I was a double major in uh, English and history, and uh, one of the profs that was really influential on me was a guy named John New, who was in the history department at University of Waterloo, and he'd been brought up from California to help to uh, stabilize or to anchor uh, the department at that time. This was a, this was a very long time ago. and. Uh, uh, he was an Englishman who had written a book called Anglican and Puritan, and I really, I still admire that title for its uh, simplicity. Uh, I asked him to tutor me, and so together one year we read a whole bunch of stuff, and one of the things that we read was Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, and I remember the day that he said to me, you've got to learn to read these things like novels. Mm -hmm. And I found that very liberating. I thought that that really encouraged me to use my interpretive imagination. And I would say that that was really an, really an important uh, point for, for my development. Yeah. Do you say that up to having that experience, you were just more, you had more comfort reading novels, reading things in that format than say tackling something huge and philosophical like the Nick McCann ethics? Well, I had read, I had read things like the Confessions when I was eighteen or nineteen or something like that. So I had in mind, you know, these these really important books that I wanted to read. But I don't think that I had felt the freedom to read them in a particular way. And I think that that's what he gave me. And especially thinking about the category of history, I thought that it was oh, I don't know, somewhat sacrosanct, or that there was a certain way to do this, or you're. You're just getting acquainted with these landmarks from the past. And uh, what I learned from that was to be more interpretively involved and to treat these great texts from the past as, as living texts so that as I became more personally involved with them, they too, paradoxically, became more alive and, and had their own lives. Right, yeah, and a lot of these topics you're looking at, literary theory, theology, literature in general, these topics can seem very abstract, very hard to get into, yes. especially if you're not in academia. Yes. So would you say, and why would you say that these things can be important to anyone with an interest, even regardless of whether you're a student or pursuing this formally? Right, yeah. I mean, that's always the big question, isn't it? People think if you're not doing it professionally, uh, the, the kind of what's the point? I, the, the disciplines that you mentioned, that. Uh, the disciplines of the arts and uh, uh, literature and so on. Uh, one of the things that I think they're really valuable for for anyone is that they encourage they encourage people to think and uh, they encourage people to to puzzle things out and and I believe that anybody can think uh, and to, to your point about why is it important if you're you know you're not going to specialize in this. Uh, Philip Larkin, this poet, has a line, uh, someone will forever be surprising a hunger in himself to be more serious. And to be more serious, to be more reflective, to be more thoughtful. I take that to be a, a, a great line uh, about the possibility of thinking. And there's, there's no limit to when a person might find themselves wanting to think, uh, no station in life, no particular age. And there's another dimension to that too. Uh, when he says surprising a hunger in oneself, uh, 
One might wake up one day and realize that there has been something going on inside to which one hasn't been properly attentive. And you might realize, oh yes, I, I have a, a question, I, I have a problem, uh, or I have a, something unsolved in, in myself, and uh, I need to, uh, or I want to, be more serious about it. Mm. Yeah, so from that, it sounds like thought isn't just, nece- it isn't just, you just start thinking about something necessarily. There are different ways to think. You can think about thinking. So how would you describe your approach to thinking about these kind of large topics? You're asking large questions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I like, I like stories, and I believe that I believe that thinking is a story. Uh, I mean, there are lots of subplots and there are lots of cross currents in thinking, but I I do think that there is a sort of narrative trajectory to thinking. Uh, I had a a a former student tell me recently that uh, they really appreciated the uh, narrative dimension to the way that I taught my courses, and uh, I really I really I really like that. Um, in my courses, I, I'm always putting up timelines, and uh, I've got a new book coming out, and there are lots of timelines in that book. I think it's important for people to have a, a narrative sense. Now, having said that, uh, I do think that obviously at, at any moment in time, at any moment in history, there's incredible depth, maybe infinite depth, complexity, density. Um, I see we're interrupted a little bit by noise in the background, but there's, um, and there's, at any particular moment in history, you might think that, gee, everything I thought I knew is wrong. Um, and I, I like to think of that as something that poetry does, that, that poetry takes us into the density of any particular moment. So maybe the way I think about thinking would be fair to say I have this linear dimension that I associate with uh, with narrative and I and I respect poetry for the depth that it brings to any particular moment and I think that that's another sort of really important aspect of what thought is yeah you mentioned um, that you get the opportunity to share your approach in your classes um, as a teaching professor uh, what are your, some of your favorite courses to teach and what do you really enjoy about those particular courses well, I love Chaucer. Uh, I specialized in Chaucer in my doctoral studies. And uh, one of the things I love about Chaucer is that he's a portal to another world uh, that is still relevant to our world. And uh, I also like the way that Chaucer is both serious and incredibly funny at the same time. And I try to convey that to students. Uh, another course that I love teaching is uh, uh, an introduction to literary theory for uh, second year undergraduate students. I find that literary theory is a topic that a lot of people find very challenging, um, confusing, um, something that they're not even quite sure what has happened when they've, when they've encountered it, whether in a class or just uh, through the way it's talked about in the media even. and. Uh, I'd like to think that in that class, I help them to establish a good foothold uh, in the topic. I come at it a different way. Um, I focus on the idea of rationality, and uh, students seem to find that really helpful. And sometimes, you know, they give me feedback years later, and I think they they found it gave them more of an anchoring than they even realized at the time. And a third course that I only started teaching recently, but I realized I, it's felt like a kind of homecoming, is I teach a course on rhetoric from the classical era through to the Enlightenment. And uh, I mean, that can sound very technical and uh, maybe uh, recondite, uh, but it's, it's quite practical, actually. And it's, again, it's very relevant to our modern world. Um, Augustine plays an important part for me in that course. Uh, Augustine solves a problem 
that Plato had with the sophists. He, Plato recognized the problem and he came up with a kind of solution, but it wasn't really very satisfying. But the solution that Augustine came up with influenced the development of Western culture from then right through to the Enlightenment and even beyond the Enlightenment. Though these days I would say that we have returned to some of the practices of the sophists and uh, if we're not practicing them ourselves, a lot of us are overwhelmed by them. And, and so I, I think we need to, we need to recover against them a little bit. Mm. I've definitely had that experience in different ways of coming across a problem that seems insoluble or there are just innumerable options and no apparent way to evaluate them. But I think in a, in a way that can also be a process that's enjoyable where you come across these big questions yes. with no obvious explanation, no obvious answers. So yes. I was wondering if there are particular, there's a particular problem or question that you enjoy kind of wrestling with in, intellectually that you don't have an answer for right now, that there may not be one answer for even, or that you just can't explain. Yeah. I love this question, and um, I mean, for the viewing audience, we are cheating. They had given me this question in advance, and when <laughs> I first read it, uh, I didn't really think too much about it, but as I reflected on it, uh, I realized it's, 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 it's really a fantastic question. And, and for me, the answer is easy. Uh, the thing that I keep thinking about and have done all my adult life is, what is the relationship between reason and emotion, or more specifically, what's the relationship between reason and love? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a binary, a dynamic, a tension that comes up all over the place. It comes up in literature, it's a way we define what literature is. It comes up in, in pop culture, um, in, in things like, if it feels so right, it can't be wrong, or, uh, just things, things like that. It comes up in, in philosophy, it comes up in theology, but I don't feel like, at least, the way we talk about it in our time and for our time, I don't think we get very far with it. And so, one of the things I like to think about is, how could we, how could we come at this question of the relationship between reason and love, reason and emotion, how could we come at it differently? How could we ask it anew? Um, and I think in some ways it might be a, a question of um, redescribing our culture or redescribing culture in general. So that's, yeah, that's an enormous question. That is an enormous question. I, I have an example <laughs> yes, uh, of that if you great. would like me to. Uh, so I'm reading this novel right now by a guy named Robert Musel. Uh, it's a trilogy. It's called The Man Without Qualities. Uh, he never completed it. He started publishing it in 1930, and uh, he says he says this. This is this is a fairly long quotation, so I'm just going to read for a little bit here. Uh, but it gets at, or it, it he draws on this relationship between reason and something other than reason. She did not believe in the existence of a soul. To her, such belief was arrogant, as well as much too definite for her own indefinite being. But neither could she believe in the earthly here and now. To understand this rightly, one must only bear in mind that this aversion from the earthly order, without compensating belief in a heavenly order, is something quintessentially natural. In every mind, there is not only logical thought going on with its austere and simple orderliness, which is a reflection of conditions in the external world, alongside it, there is also affective thought going on with a logic, if one can call it logic at all, of its own, which is appropriate to the peculiarities of the feelings, the passions, and the moods. The laws governing these two bear roughly the same relationship to each other as the laws of a timber yard, where chunks of wood are hewn into rectangular shape and stack ready for transport, bear to the dark interlacing laws of the forest with all their mysterious workings and rustlings. And since the objects of our thinking are far from being independent of the state of our, th of the state our thinking is in, in every man these two modes of thought get mixed up 
with each other. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful passage. It's kind of bizarre, the metaphor of a timber yard, uh, but he's, he's really thinking about the relationship between logic and, um, and affect or feelings, passions, moods, uh, what you will. And to me, it comes up over and over and again. I, I think it's a great question. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, it's an incredible passage and incredibly evocative and has so much going on in it. Um, and I also think that that captures a little bit, again, of the complexity of all of these questions and how once you start to think about these big questions, you will reach these points of where it can feel frustrating. It can be overwhelming, as you were saying, if you haven't previously especially thought about all of these all of these areas um, and I think especially like for myself as a student as a young person there's a particular pressures on you to uh, get things figured out which is not yes. which is can seem antithetical to this kind of thinking yes um, and so I was just wondering for yourself when you were a young person when you were a student what did you when you were first starting to think about these questions what did you need to hear at that time well I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to meet a wonderful person and she's going to be very supportive all the way through. So that, in, re in retrospect, that helps me and I think it really would have helped me at the time. Uh, but, but also, uh, as an English major and as like a double major, interested in history and interested in an imaginative, imaginative interpretive approach to all kinds of texts. Uh, it's, it's tempting, and I think this temptation can be more subtle than we realize. It's tempting to rely on intuition and therefore to take shortcuts. Mm -hmm and to be taking shortcuts even when you don't think you are. And there are no shortcuts. And there are difficult questions and there are choices that have to be made metaphysically and ontologically speaking. I wish that someone had introduced me to analogical thinking sooner than I was introduced to it, or maybe insisted that I uh, slow down until uh, I had recognized that I had had this encounter with analogical thinking. Um, I wish that, uh, I wish that there had been um, perhaps just a little bit more stubbornness uh, in, in, in that regard. But now we're talking about life and learning and uh, limitations of character. So, <laughs> so, you know, who can, who can really, who can really, you know, complain about what has happened? Sure. You just mentioned that analogical thinking is something that's helped perhaps with um, slowing down, not taking these shortcuts. Is there, how would you uh, describe the way that that particular approach has been illuminating to you, even in that aspect of slowing down your thought? The way that I teach the uh, rhetoric course that I do, I introduce students to a pre-modern way of thinking. And in this pre-modern way of thinking, which we, we, we really aren't given much exposure to, um, one book that I use calls it the ontotheological synthesis. And the idea is really quite simple, that the realms of, uh, the, the divine realm, the human realm, and what we think of as the natural realm are all connected. And that sense of interaction between levels or of the levels all being connected um, really changes the way you think about how you're going to define categories 
or how you think things can be potentially cut off from each other. It doesn't mean that things don't have their own distinct being, but it introduces a, a, a complexity and a richness to thinking about how things can be related to one another. And just to give you a very simple example, which um, um, I learned from uh, Malcolm Guyton. Malcolm Guyton was talking about Owen Barfield in this. You take a word, an ancient word like pneuma. Uh, that single word pneuma in the ancient world means simultaneously spirit, divine spirit, it means breath, and it means wind, all at the same time. So there simply wasn't a sense that these realms were tidally disconnected from each other. There were analogies between them. There were connections uh, between them. And uh, I think we need to recover uh, an appreciation of that sort of thing. Mm. We've spoken a lot about the difficulties of this kind of thought. Um, but I was also wondering, what are some of the things that you particularly enjoy reading authors' particular books that you love? I love... I love reading Chaucer, and I love um, slowing down and um, trying to simply establish the basic literal meaning of certain lines of poetry. This may seem this may seem odd, uh, but it's easy to gloss over uh, the even the the basic superficial meaning of some lines of, of Chaucer, and that's even for uh, serious long-time readers uh, of Chaucer. I keep surprising myself in this regard. Um, my students help me to slow down in, in this regard, and I really enjoy that. Similarly, I, I really enjoy rereading things that I'm about to teach again. So rereading poems, rereading short stories, uh, bits of criticism, bits of philosophy, uh, primary texts, and, and it really doesn't matter what era it is, uh, but I, I enjoy reading those kinds of things. Um, other than that, some of my favorite authors, uh, I love a philosopher from the, mid uh, from the mid 20th century named John McMurray. Um, I love Iris Murdoch. Uh, Sigurd Unset is a Norwegian uh, novelist who wrote two fantastic trilogies about the Norwegian Middle Ages. Uh, I, I love those. Um, I like the Canadian novelist. David Adams Richards. Uh, to help me get clarity, uh, I turn to people like uh, Rowan Williams and uh, Terry Eagleton. I enjoy them very much, which is not to say that they're not challenging, but they, they help me a great deal. What are you reading right now? What am I reading right now? Well, I'm continuing to read Robert Musil, and uh, uh, further to this project of thinking about the relationship between uh, reason and love, uh, I read a book recently that put me on to an early work by Paul Ricoeur, who is someone who does philosophical hermeneutics, who was himself influenced by Hans-Jörg Gadamer. And this early work uh, talks about the relationship between reason and emotion. And he's very much engaged with uh, Immanuel Kant and, and, and his thinking on the subject. He's not happy with Kant. He himself, I think, is trying to do something new for the mid-20th century. Uh, so I'm getting acquainted with that and adding it to the hopper. Interesting. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to share this background to the courses that, um, that you're offering publicly um, on this YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's true. The, the, the lectures are publicly available, and uh, I hope they're helpful to... Uh, to a few people, hopefully a lot of people. Um, it's the stuff I've been thinking about for a long time, and um, uh, students tell me they find it helpful, and it's a pleasure to talk about these things with you. So thanks for thanks for doing this with yeah, me. It's been great.